Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Our speaker this evening was ordained in 1996 when he finished his Master of Arts degree at the Angelicum in Rome. Father Scalia has served as parochial vicar at several parishes in the Diocese of Arlington and as pastor of St. John the Beloved in McLean. He currently serves as the Episcopal Vicar for Clergy, Director of the Permanent Diaconate Program, and pastor of St. James in Falls Church, Virginia. Author of That Nothing May Be Lost, Reflections on Catholic Doctrine and Devotion, and editor of Sermons in Times of Crisis, 12 Homilies to Stir Your Soul, Father Scalia is a member of the Institute's Board of Advisors and has given numerous extremely popular lectures for us. So we are so pleased to be able to welcome back to the Institute such a wonderful priest and great friend, Father Paul Scalia. Good to be with you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God and Father, as we hasten to the celebration of your son's birth, we ask you to purify our hearts and minds that we may be made ready to receive him, that he might find warmth in our hearts as as he comes to us at Christmas. Enlighten our minds this evening, uh, direct our our thoughts and words that uh, our discussion may give you glory and bring to us the truth that saves. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now this evening, we're going to be talking about a lot of kind of heavy things. Uh, vengeance, wrath, uh, destruction. And uh, so I'd like to begin with a little bit of levity. So uh, in, the, uh, in the movie Hail Caesar came out, I don't know, uh, five or six years ago, something like that, Uh, which it's a send up of a Hollywood studio in the 1950s. And um, there's a scene that depicts the argument between a Catholic priest, a rabbi, an Orthodox patriarch, and uh, a Protestant minister. It it sounds like uh, a joke. And um, well, it, it is. It's a very funny scene. The the religious leaders are brought together by the producer of, of a film uh, because he wants to discuss with them the depiction of Christ in the upcoming movie. Now, obviously, this is this is an antiquated notion that uh, Hollywood, be, Hollywood would be concerned about what religious leaders thought. And in, in the ensuing conversation between these leaders, the stereotype of each character and each religion is lampooned. No religion, no denomination is spared. For our purposes, there's one exchange in particular uh, that I think is revealing. Uh, At one point, the rabbi bristles, uh, understandably, at the suggestion that Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God. He bristles at the notion that God has a son. And he says, what, God has children? What, and a dog? A collie, maybe? God doesn't have children. He's a bachelor and very angry. And then the priest responds, no, 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 he used to be angry. And then the rabbi says, what, he got over it? And then the minister steps in. He says, you worship the God of another age. And the priest chimes in, who has no love. And the rabbi says, not true. He likes Jews. And he gets the better of the argument. He is the only one in in the whole thing who's who's kind of consistent. The whole scene, that whole setup hinges on uh, the old saw that we've all heard about the difference between the so-called God of the Old Testament and the so-called God of the New Testament. We've all heard it, right? The God of the Old Testament is vengeful, judgmental, wrathful. And the God of the New Testament is loving, compassionate, caring, and, and so on. We've all heard it before. It is, of course, heresy because it posits two gods or perhaps just one God who's schizophrenic. Either way, it's not good. In fact, it's one of the first heresies that the church had to face. It's called Marcionism. 
Father John Harden, the great uh, Jesuit uh, teacher, he defines Marcionism as follows. He says it's a second century heresy of Marcion and his followers who rejected the Old Testament and claimed that the apostles were wrong in claiming that the New Testament is a fulfillment of the old. Marcion claimed to be teaching a pure Christianity after the example of St. Paul. He, he wrote a mutilated revision of the New Testament, consisting mainly of the Gospel of St. Luke and 10 letters of St. Paul. The Marcionists' principal doctrine was that Christianity is wholly a gospel of love to the exclusion of any law. Sound familiar? I mean, that's, o- that's always the, uh, the, uh, the point, right? When the Old Testament is sort of depicted in purely negative terms. So the point is always that uh, God is just about love and doesn't care about anything else. Now, I don't know that you or I have ever run into anyone who identifies himself as a Marcionist. But practically speaking, there are actually many in the church. Whenever we buy into the stereotype of bad Old Testament God, good New Testament God, then we've fallen into Marcionism. Or more likely, uh, we fall into it in sort of a softer way when we neglect the Old Testament and and just focus uh, everything on the New Testament, which, by the way, will just lead to confusion. Now, of course, the opposition of the Old Testament and the New Testament in this way is based on a superficial reading uh, of both, because there are plenty of beautiful, compassionate, and tender verses about God and from God uh, in the Old Testament. Just let me read two. Isaiah 49, Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. And then the Lord responds, Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have graven you on the palms of my hands. A beautiful, beautiful image. And then from Hosea, which the book of Hosea contains some pretty severe verses, but then it also has this. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce, fierce anger. I will, not dis- I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come to destroy. Again, another beautiful line. It's a passage actually that is used in um, for the Feast of the Sacred Heart, which shows just you know, how the church recognizes in that an expression of of God's love. And at the same time, we should be aware that there are many um, very severe and I I think terrifying lines spoken by our Lord in the Gospels. Uh, Matthew 18, the Lord summoned him and said, you wicked servant, I forgave all that all that debt because you besought me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord delivered him to the jailers till he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forget, forgive your brother from your heart. Which raises kind of an, an, an interesting point about this whole controversy. People trivialize the severity of forgiveness. You know, they think, oh, the New Testament God is a forgiving God. That is true. <laughs> But he also demands that we forgive, and, uh, and he has promised some, a, a severe punishment if we do not. What about what our Lord says to the Pharisees? You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Uh, hell is almost never mentioned in the Old Testament. I can't think of one passage. Hell is a really a, it, it doesn't, the theology of it doesn't develop uh, until much, much later, The one who speaks of hell the most is Jesus Christ. Not even St. Paul, who could be pretty severe at times. Or the passage about from Matthew 25, when the king returns in his glory. And what does he say to those who failed to serve him in the poor? Well, it says they will go away into eternal punishment. Uh, You know, and then. Uh, What does our Lord say? And this is, I think, uh, apt for our times. 
Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung round his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Okay. Well, okay, so our, our Lord definitely had the capacity to speak severely. And um, uh, one last one, this is, this is the parable of, of the... Um, uh, uh, of the the three men who are entrusted with talents. It's from Luke's gospel, Luke 19. And of course, it's a telling of what will happen when our Lord comes again. And so the figure who represents our Lord returns and he rewards the first two and he punishes the third. And then he, the whole parable concludes with, as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them before me. And then And then Luke says, after that, he, you know, he basically he enters Jerusalem after that. It, it's an extraordinary uh, passage because it's, it's one in which our Lord is describing himself. Now, more importantly, this sort of uh, bifurcated view of the Old and New Testament, it damages a New Testament principle, uh, namely Christ as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies and types. Throughout Matthew's gospel, uh, he tells us precisely when our Lord is fulfilling some prophecy. Uh, And he does so because the fulfillment is proof to his Jewish audience that Jesus of Nazareth is the prophesied Messiah. He is the one that they've been waiting for. And so the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies is necessary for that. This is why on the road to Emmaus, on uh, Easter afternoon and evening, our Lord instructs the disciples, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all in, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And so this, this sort of division of old and new, uh, it damages the new because now Christ is, is not a fulfillment anymore. Uh, he's not the one who has been promised. Um. And what that does is it wrenches the the New Testament out of its biblical context. And many passages in the New Testament become indecipherable. Uh, Just make note of of next Sunday's gospel or or this Sunday's gospel. When when they come to John and they they ask him, are you the prophet? Are you Elias? Are um, are you Elijah? Are you you the Christ? It's all rooted in, in Old Testament expectations. But if we if we don't have that understanding, if we don't have that appreciation of the the, the connection of these two, then then it becomes uh, indecipherable. And once that happens, once the New Testament is is sort of disconnected, either absolutely or in practice from the Old Testament, then all we're left with is moral exhortations. And that is why so many priests uh, reduce their sermons or homilies to just moral exhortations, and they're not they're not giving the biblical context for what is happening there. They've bought into a soft version of Marcionism, neglecting the connection between the two testaments. So the differences between the Old and New Testament are exaggerated and overstated. However, in saying that, we implicitly recognize that there is a difference. There is some kind of distinction between the old and the new, which is why we call one old and the other new. So in the Old Testament, let me just run through some examples. We find great violence on the part of God and his people. For starters, there's the whole Sodom and Gomorrah destruction thing, right? Later, the Lord sends plagues upon Egypt, turns a river into blood, for example, kills their firstborn, and drowns their army. The Levites at the foot of Mount Sinai slaughter 3,000 of their countrymen and are rewarded with the priesthood. In fact, that's their ordination right. <laughs> that's basically what it said. It's like, you've just ordained yourselves priests. Um, later, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, when they rebelled, they are swallowed up by the earth. Serpents rise up in punishment of the Israelites when they complain, when they murmur when they grumble against Moses, so no grumbling. Uh, Phineas stays the plague when he, when he spears through a couple that is, um, well, in the act of, of fornication. 
Uh, through Moses, the Lord commands that the nations of the land of Canaan be wiped out. He doesn't say, go in there and make, make treaties with them, enter into a concordat. He says, no, wipe them out. Uh, cities are placed under the ban, cities like Jericho. In the book of Judges, the Lord punishes the Israelites, Israelites precisely because they did not wipe out the nations around them. And then further on, he takes the kingship from Saul. Why? Precisely because Saul did not uh, wipe out everybody that he was supposed to. The Lord punishes David and all of Israel for David taking a census. He destroys the Assyrians with a plague. And then he sends the Israelites into exile, as he makes clear. So this is a lot of wrath and vengeance, isn't it? Um, and we don't find this in, in, in the New Testament as much. We don't find this in the Gospels, to be sure. Um, it's a very different thing than we generally hear and see from our Lord himself in the Gospels. We hear about forgiving your enemy, turning the other cheek, blessing those who persecute you, and so on. Uh, our Lord does not crush his enemies. He gives himself up to them. He gives himself up to death at their hands. And even after his resurrection, like if you or I had risen from the dead after, after being crucified by, by our enemies, we probably would have visited them, right? You know, I would have appeared to Herod and, or, or to, to, to Pilate or, or to Annas and Caiaphas and said, let's continue that conversation from Friday, shall we? Um, but our Lord doesn't do that. Even after his resurrection, he doesn't visit vengeance and wrath upon them. He just appears to uh, his followers. So there is a difference. It's been overstated, but there is a difference. Now, how are we to make sense of this? Um, let me outline five principles uh, that provide a way not of solving uh, this, but of, of helping us to begin to understand it. And the first one I've already kind of touched on, and it's fundamental. Continuity and discontinuity. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is both continuity and discontinuity. There has to be. There has to be continuity in order for the New Testament to be the fulfillment of the old. But at the same time, there has to be a discontinuity in order for the New Testament to be, well, new. It has to be different from what came before. God promised to do something new uh, in fulfillment of his promises. So we should not be surprised to find a difference, a discontinuity. And, and this relationship of continuity and discontinuity is at the heart of things. The whole point of the incarnation that we are about to celebrate is that the God of the New Testament, uh, rather the, that the God of the Old Testament, whose face could not be seen, has now revealed himself to us as a child and as the man of sorrows. Now we can look upon his face. Now we can gaze upon him. The one who shielded Moses from looking at him now reveals himself to us in the face of a little child. Uh, he's drawn close to us. Uh, the one who is completely transcendent has now drawn close to us by taking on our human nature. The danger is to choose continuity or discontinuity, one to the exclusion of the other. To insist on continuity alone misses the point of the new thing that God accomplishes. To emphasize the discontinuity or to, to make it a break, an absolute break, that effectively establishes two gods. So these two things must be held together in harmony, the, the, the continuity and discontinuity, as the ancient saying has it, the new is concealed in the old, and the old is revealed in the new. The second principle, divine simplicity. Divine simplicity. Much of this whole uh, issue focus, uh, focuses on the attributes of God. Uh, his justice, his anger, his mercy his love. These are different attributes of God. 
And it's true that at some times we encounter these uh, more than uh, at other times. And we make the mistake of thinking of God in human terms. So we think of his attributes as like parts of his personality, as parts of, of who he is, as we would think of it as, you know, parts of a friend's personality. You know, you might say about someone, um, you know, hey, yeah, you know, he, yeah, he can be really serious, but when you get to know him, he's a really fun guy. Right? These are kind of two different parts of his personality, right? Or, um, yeah, yeah, he's, he's really kind and gentle and nice, <laughs> but don't get him angry, right? <laughs> okay, these are two different parts of a personality. Well, uh, with God, there are, there's no such thing as parts. Um, he, they're not parts of his personality. It doesn't depend on whether or not we get him in a good mood or a bad mood. Um, God is entirely simple. It's not just that there is one God. It is also that God is one in the sense of being whole and entire, integral, simple. And so these different attributes are never at odds with one another. There's never any conflict because in God, they are all one. They are all just, they, they are all united in the one God who is love. So truth, uh, goodness, holiness, and other attributes, um, as we conceive and define them, um, when we apply them to God, we have to realize that they are all ultimately identical in meaning and describe the same ultimate reality, the one infinitely perfect and simple being. And if we don't have it that way, then we're going to have division in God. He's, he's either now more than one God or he's schizophrenic. So his anger is not opposed to his love. Uh, his justice is not opposed to his mercy, nor are they just different parts of him. These things are, are, uh, are one in him. And again, uh, that, that passage that I read earlier from Hosea, when, when, when the Lord of Israel says, I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come to destroy. In other words, his almighty power is shown most of all in his capacity to have mercy. And we, in our minds, make a, uh, we make a division between these things. We separate uh, power and mercy. And this means that his anger and his punishment are as good for us as his gentleness and his mercy. And that's a very difficult thing for us to get our minds around. Um, what does he say in Deuteronomy? You shall remember all the way in which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but that man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God, out of the mouth of the Lord. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. In other words, uh, the, the harsh dealing that we encounter in the Old Testament is at the service of discipline to introduce the Israelites into a, a, a more perfect relationship with, with the Lord so that he can reveal himself uh, to them as father. And Hebrews uh, 12 uh, gets at this as well. Have you forgotten the exhortation which addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor lose courage when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines him whom he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? So again, here is that discipline, that punishment, which we in our minds associate with like one kind of personality, but now is revealed in scripture to be at the service really of, of our Lord's love. In fact, God's refusal to punish us when he does not punish us, that's worse than his punishment. That should frighten us. St. Paul writes to the Romans, 
The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. And how is his wrath revealed? God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. He gave them up. He allowed them to continue in sin that way. When really the better thing for them, the the greater expression of God's love would have been if he had disciplined them. His discipline uh, is for our good. Uh, It is to break us from sin, to purify our motives. Uh, When God God does not punish us, when we're not disciplined, uh, that's when we should worry. So it is not that we catch God in a good mood or a bad mood. It's not that God got over his anger. Um, it is it is that he is simple and that the way he disciplines us uh, is at the service of his love and mercy and compassion. And this brings us to, to the third principle, the divine pedagogy. The catechism and other church documents uh, use this term divine pedagogy. Uh, Of course, we find it in in the church fathers, uh, perhaps not exactly that term, but it it basically describes the way God teaches us and the way he reveals himself to us. Paragraph 53 of the catechism, the divine plan of revelation is realized simultaneously by deeds and words, which are intrinsically bound up with each other and shed light on each other. It involves a specific divine pedagogy. God communicates himself to man gradually. He prepares him to welcome by stages the supernatural revelation that is to culminate in the person and mission of the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. God is a good teacher, right? And you know that, that, that you don't teach second graders the same way you teach eighth graders. Why? Because second graders are capable of more than eighth graders. Eighth graders, they're just, you know, they're middle schoolers. The mind has gone bonkers, right? Second graders are still, you can still teach them. Um, the scholastic maxim is this. Whatever is received is received according to the mode of the receiver. So God teaches us he, uh, according to our capacity to understand. Um, he doesn't just teach us um, according to his capacity to teach because we would never get that. This principle, the divine pedagogy, is um, it is really fulfilled uh, at Christmas, isn't it? When God comes to us, he proportions himself to us so that he can reveal his divine truth to us. He doesn't expect us to be able to grasp divine truth. He comes down to our level and teaches without sacrificing any of his truth or dignity. He comes down to our level in order to teach us. And so this is the way of understanding how he acted one way in the Old Testament, but differently in the New Testament. Um, He speaks to a way that we can understand, and there was a different situation in the Old Testament, wasn't there? St. Paul touches on this in Galatians 3, when he discusses the role of the law in the Old Testament as preparing the way for faith. It was provisional for people who, who were still being prepared for the full revelation. Um, let me give two examples of this, um, this divine pedagogy. One is the transition of Israel from what we can call monolatria, uh, which is the worship of only one God, to monotheism, which is the belief in only one God. So Abram just worshiped one God, right? Uh, and um, Isaac and Jacob just worshiped one God. But they weren't yet monotheists, were they? Because there was this gradual uh, understanding and awareness that the one God that they worshipped was the only God. Uh, And uh, the Catechism mentions this explicitly, paragraph uh, 212, that that there was a gradual realization on the part of the Israelites that it's not just that they were only to worship uh, the Lord of Israel. It was also that the Lord of Israel is the only God. And and of course, this is perfected uh, really during the exile uh, when they're in this completely pagan atmosphere after after trying to live 
you know, the, the covenant with the God of Israel in this pagan atmosphere, they realize the Lord of Israel is the Lord alone. And now the full import of that meaning from, you know, from Deuteronomy 6, the full import of that verse is, is dawning on them. Another example is um, uh, a monogamous marriage, right? I mean, we, we find polygamy in the Old Testament. It's worth mentioning, especially if people bring this up to you, uh, it's worth mentioning because they'll say, oh, yeah, well, there is polygamy in the Old Testament, you know. It's worth telling people, yes, there was, and it never ended well. <laughs> it didn't end well for Abraham, for Jacob, and God knows it didn't end well for Solomon, okay, or, or David, right? So it was never a good thing. But for some reason, it was allowed. And what else? Divorce was allowed. Uh, and, and our Lord, give, he, he kind of speaks of this, right, when in Matthew 19, when they say, well, why did Moses, you know, command us to write a certificate of divorce? Um, and he says, because your hardness of heart. In other words, you weren't yet ready for the full revelation of the truth. Now, with the arrival of the Messiah, with the giving of grace, now you are ready to receive the, the fullness of this truth. Okay. So that, that's kind of the divine pedagogy uh, at work. And so we find God dealing uh, differently with his people in the New Testament than in the Old. Uh, they're in a different position than their ancestors were. Uh, he dealt with with um, he dealt with man in Noah's time in one way. He dealt with Abram another way. The Hebrews in in Egypt another way, uh, and so on. And it's not because there are two or three or four, how many, however many gods, uh, but it's because the same truth is being uh, conveyed in a different situation. And we find this even in, um, for example, different prophets. Uh, go through the book of Isaiah. There are some beautiful, beautiful uh, prophecies in Isaiah. There are also terrifying prophecies in Isaiah. And Jeremiah is even more pronounced. I mean, Jeremiah, uh, um, uh, a, a friend of mine had a notoriously grumpy husband. And, um, and when he died and I was uh, consoling her, she laughed and she, 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 she joked that she, she used to tell people, now I know what Mrs. Jeremiah must have felt like, right? So Jeremiah was notoriously, uh, you know, severe. But then there, there is a switch in his prophesying uh, in, in which he, he, he starts prophesying differently to the Israelites in exile. Why? Well, because he's no longer warning them of what's to come because it's come. Now he's consoling them and giving them words of hope. Same prophet, right? It's not like we've got an old Jeremiah and a new Jeremiah, although scripture scholars would probably say that, but that's for another day. Um, so the severity of God in the Old Testament, it is strong medicine. There's no doubt about it, but it's strong medicine to deliver them from slavery and to deliver them not just from the slavery of the Egyptians, but from the slavery of their own idolatry. And it is to warn them against all of the nations around them to warn them against that, that apostasy, to warn them against sacrificing their children. Um, it's strong medicine for that. And by the time our Lord arrives, what do we find? We find that, that the oneness of God uh, and, and that, that, that monotheism now is entrenched. We find that, we, we find that, that by the time the bridegroom arrives, that, that the understanding of marriage is now uh, much healthier than it had been before. There's another dimension to this teaching style, and that's um, uh, what St. Paul brings up when he says that the events in the Old Testament were written for our instruction, written for our instruction. And twice in, in that same section of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, he describes the events of the Old Testament as a warning to us. So what we see happen in um, ancient Israel's history uh, is a type. Uh, it's a preview or a trailer. I like to think of typology as a trailer uh, of what is to come, um, of what happens in the church's history. So except that with Israel, it was an earthly kingdom dealing with worldly powers, right? But uh, with the church, we have a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God, established against principalities, against the powers, against the worldly rulers of this present darkness, and so on. And so what we see happening there is written for our instruction so that we can make sense of what's happening now. And so if there's a certain severity that we see there, it is to call our attention to the battle that we're in now. 
And so the, Israel's history is, is something of a template for us because we are the new Israel. Um, if, uh, if saving, if delivering the Israelites from, from Egypt uh, require the destruction of the, of the Egyptian army, then, you know, <laughs> what must be required for us, right? The new Israel. Fourth principle, mystery. Um, even though there is a continuity, and even though there are prophecies that are fulfilled, um, we will never completely understand the continuity. We will always experience uh, an element of the discontinuity. Um, God both reveals and veils. Even uh, the Catechism, uh, paragraph 206, has a, a wonderful reflection on the revelation of the divine name on Mount, uh, on Mount Sinai. Uh, in uh, Exodus 3.14, um, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say, to this, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And the catechism discusses how this is the revelation of a name, but at the same time, the name is kind of a mystery. It's kind of a weird name, right? Uh, what does it mean? And so there, there, uh, we should expect, we should never expect things to be completely revealed to us. And so with the continuity will always be the discontinuity. There will always be an element of mystery. And this, of course, is what happens in the New Testament. This is why when the wise men arrive in Jerusalem and they say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? <laughs> uh, Matthew says, Herod the king was troubled. Imagine he was. And all Jerusalem with him because they realized they had failed to uh, interpret the prophecies properly. They'd missed the coming of the Messiah. Now, Herod was bothered for a different reason. But, uh, you know, all Jerusalem with him, they'd missed it. Now, why does our Lord do this? Why can't he make it really clear? You know, this is one of the criticisms, by the way, of, of C.S. Lewis, that sometimes his illusions are just way too transparent, right? Um like the character, the Christ character in, in the, the, the science fiction trilogy, um, his name is Ransom. Okay. Okay. That's not that uh, <laughs> mysterious, right? Okay. He's a Christ figure, Ransom. Okay. We get it. We get it. Um, why, isn't, why isn't God more like C.S. Lewis? Why can't he make it more transparent so that we get it? Well, it's the same principle behind the parables, right? Why does our Lord speak in parables? This is why I speak to them in parables, he says, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand, with them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, you shall indeed hear but never understand, and you shall indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are heavy of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should perceive with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn for me to heal them. In other words... The parables are designed to confound the proud. Those who want, want it on their own terms, who want to have it all figured out, they will never perceive it. That's why our Lord speaks to parables. The parables are intended for those who are willing to be taught and are willing to allow the mystery of God to remain. Those who want to break the mystery to solve everything, they'll never get it. And so only if we have a sense of mystery, um, only if we are those who value trusting God more than solving God, only, only we will be able to receive his word if we have that attitude. And finally, a, a fifth principle, uh, the punishment that awaits. Although the Old Testament uh, does seem, I, I think it's legitimate to say it's got more accounts of vengeance and punishment than the new, there is still plenty of it in the new. It just hasn't happened yet. It hasn't come to fruition yet. It hasn't been unveiled. We find it um, in the book of, Revel of Revelation, the Apocalypsis, the unveiling, uh, the book of unveiling. Uh, that book is unveiling not so much what will happen in the future, but what is already happening, really, uh, because we are in the end times. And so what do we hear in the book of Revelation? Early on in the messages to the churches, we hear severe punishment to the church in Pergamum. He says, you also have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. 
Repent then, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. To the church of Theatira, he says, I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her doings, and I will strike her children dead. And most famously to the uh, church in Laodicea, he says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Okay, so uh, the, the New Testament certainly has uh, such accounts. Um, and in the sixth chapter of Revelation, what do we hear? We hear about the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They are, they are under the altar in heaven, and they cry out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before thou wilt judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? And so here are the souls of the just crying out for vengeance. Much of Revelation tells of the definitive coming of the kingdom and the accompanying punishment, vengeance, and wrath uh, that will be unleashed when God's kingdom is definitively revealed and established. Chapter 14 on basically uh, is is touching on all of that. And what we saw in in miniature, if you will, uh, regarding the ancient nations opposing Israel, so we will see in the fullness regarding all nations opposing the new Israel, Christ's church, the kingdom of God. So what, what we saw back then in the Old Testament is, is a type, it is a preview of that final battle that will come before the Lord uh, and, uh, and his uh, enemies. So Advent is the perfect time to discuss this uh, relationship between the Old Testament and the New, because Advent, of course, focuses on uh, our Lord's coming and his coming precisely as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. But notice um, that there's a sort of a disjunction, a discontinuity uh, between many of the readings and then what ultimately happens. So, for example, the first reading of Advent uh, for the first Sunday of Advent this year. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down with the mountains quaking before you while you wrought awesome deeds we could not hope for such as they had not heard of from of old. Behold, you are angry, and we are sinful. And then later on, of course, last week, I think, we we heard about majestic, dramatic actions, highways being constructed in wastelands, valleys being filled, hills made low, the rugged land a plain, the rough country a broad valley, and so on. All of these huge things happening. But then when our Lord comes, what happens? Well, it ha- happens in darkness. And in silence, well, when half spent was the night, uh, his power is revealed in his capacity to show mercy, his capacity uh, to be meek and to be humble of heart. Uh, It doesn't mean that this is not a powerful coming. It is the revelation of his power, but in a way that we did not anticipate. It is something that is more dramatic than rending the heavens, more dramatic than a highway through the desert. John the Baptist is, of course, a prominent figure in Advent. We, we heard about him last week and this week. Uh, and, of course, he has, he has a severe and sobering message of repentance. And the people see him as a fulfillment. Uh, today we hear, they think that he's a fulfillment of the prophecy of the prophet to succeed Moses, or he's, the, uh, the, he's Elijah come again, or he's the Christ himself. He's none of those things, of course. But he's come as a messenger of the one who fulfills all things. He's kind of the bridge between the two. And yet when our Lord arrives, um, the discontinuity is disturbing to John. Cardinal Ratzinger uh, has a great reflection on John's sort of agony when he's in prison. uh, Matthew uh, chapter 11. And Cardinal Ratzinger puts it this way. In words of burning power, John had prophesied the coming of the judge and had painted in fiery colors the great day of the Lord. 
he had portrayed the Messiah as the judge with the winnowing fan in his hand that would separate the chaff from the grain and throw the chaff once and for all into the eternal fire. He had portrayed him as one who would cast out this adulterous generation and if need be, raise up children of Abraham from the very stones to replace the faithless people who called themselves the children of Abraham as the one who had already laid the ax to the root so as to cut down the tree. Above all, amid the terrible ambivalence of this world where we are constantly waiting and hoping in darkness, John had expected and proclaimed a clear message that the day would finally come and dispel the hopeless darkness in which men are tossed to and fro so that they know not what they are going, where they are, they, are, they are going. The ambiguity would disappear. And then, meanwhile, the one had come. And at God's command, John's prophetic finger pointed him out. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God's presence had begun, but what a difference from what John had imagined. No fire fell from heaven to consume sinners and bear definitive witness to the just. In fact, nothing changed at all in the present world. Jesus went about preaching and doing good in the land, but the ambiguity remained. Human life continued to be an obscure mystery that man has to pursue with faith and hope into the world's darkness. It's a beautiful reflection. And, and the whole point of it is that John now has to like make an act of faith again, that this man who is so different from what he had anticipated is the fulfillment. John himself had to struggle with the continuity and the discontinuity. And, and of course, he is the one we are to imitate in, in going through that process of struggling with that and, and trusting that there is continuity even when we are, we are disturbed by the discontinuity trusting that this is all woven into God's plan, trusting as, as John did. Finally, there is one person for whom the differences between the Old and the New Testaments poses no problem whatsoever, the Blessed Virgin Mary, which doesn't mean that she didn't see the differences, only that with her pure heart in perfect accord with God's mind and will, she saw things most clearly. Um, and most, and more importantly, in perfect obedience, she allowed God to reveal his plan. She didn't impose her own interpretation on his prophecies, and she didn't demand that the fulfillment be on her terms. She wondered at, but also trusted that the God of Israel, the same God who sent plagues upon Egypt, who split the Red Sea in two, who uprooted nations, who set Israel into exile and brought her back again, the God, that God of Israel would show his greatest power and might by taking flesh in her womb and giving that flesh on the cross for our salvation. Edward Lean, great uh, spiritual writer, in describing the presentation of the Christ child in the temple, uh, he puts it this way. While Mary was contemplating the wondrous vision that was opened up to her mental gaze by this glorious prophecy, the eyes of Simeon were turned from the face of the child and fell on the mother. It is hard for us to know how far Mary's vision had up to this moment pierced the veil of futurity and seen what lay before her divine son. She had read and pondered on the oracles of the prophets relating to the Messiah. Many of them spoke of glory, but several also set forth details of suffering and ignominy. God did not reveal all to her from the beginning. She dimly surmised what was to be. She had, she had too much spiritual understanding to be carried away, as her countrymen were, by the predictions concerning the Messiah, which seemed to promise a career of earthly triumph and glory. The visions of the prophets that unfolded scenes of bitter suffering and final rejection were, for her, the ones that more literally than the others set forth the earthly destiny of her child. May Our Lady, who understands this perfectly, May she intercede for us with the God of Israel, the creator of heaven and earth, the Lord of hosts, whom she bore in her womb and placed in the manger in Bethlehem. God bless. Thank you. All right. So I think we have a number of questions that have come in. Yes, um, thank you, Kelsey. Thank you. We, I've got a question here um, from Daria. Father, at the end of your talk tonight, um, I think you were quoting from uh, Cardinal Ratzinger. Right. Uh, which book... What, yeah. what book was that? It uh, the book is Dogma and Preaching, and um, and and at the end of the book is uh, or the, I guess it's the second half of the book is uh, 
meditations and sermons that he gave. And it's, it's, a, it's a sermon that he gave on, on, uh, for, for Advent. And, and especially on that, that kind of that, what some people call the St. John the Baptist's vocation crisis when he's in prison. He's like, are you the one who is to come or do we look for someone else? So Dogma okay. and Preaching is the name of the book. Wonderful. Most of it is very, like the first half of it is very dense. And then when you get to, you know, it's theological. But then when you get to his sermons, there's a great example of uh, uh, whatever is received is received according to the mode of the receiver. There's a great example of good pedagogy. His theological stuff, when he's speaking to theologians, is very dense. But when he's speaking, when he's just giving sermons, it's really accessible. Thank you. Nice. Father Scalia, we have a question coming in from Maria. Um, and she um, asked this. She admits perhaps this is a gross generalization, but it seems to her that um, is it more of the more popular Protestant churches that kind of focus on the New Testament niceness of Jesus, or do you find this to be a problem in many Catholic um, spheres as well? I think probably that might be true for mainline Protestants. I, um, it, I don't think it's I don't think it's true for fundamentalists. I, I think actually a lot of the big mega churches have they they I think that they're they're pretty in you know in tune with 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 the Old Testament, and. and um, but I think with the mainline churches, yeah, I think you have a lot of that going on. And, um, you know, listen, this has been a real problem in, uh, in Catholic preaching for a while, you know, just staying away from, uh, from, from anything harsh or difficult uh, and making everything happy clappy. So it's uh, by no means um, being Catholic is not a firewall. It's that mistake. Father, can you uh, speak on our current situation today as far as you're talking about the divine pedagogy? Well, the Old Testament, um, may the people of the Old Testament uh, kind of struggled without all of the grace given by the incarnation and the resurrection. Yeah. Nevertheless, today, so many are living uh, almost in a worse situation than the people of the Old Testament. Having received the grace and either denied it or neglected it. It's one of the most uh, horrifying lines in the New Testament when St. Paul says, do not receive the grace of God in vain. You know, just the, the whole concept that you that God can give you uh, his grace and it sort of, you know, in effect bounces off of you. I think uh, there's decline in baptisms. And so there's a decline of grace in the world. Um, I just did a baptism today. It was in Spanish. but And so the you know, you get used to one translation when I was reading in Spanish, it kind of struck me that uh, at one point it says the church rejoices in adding to its members, right? Uh, adding, and and that can come across as sort of too triumphalistic or, or conceited, like, hey, there, now there's more of us. But what it really means is, no, now there is actually somebody who's been graced, another person who's been touched by God's grace in the world, and that's good for the world. Um and I think this also explains uh, the decline in marriage, right? Uh, um, I, I, I just know in my priesthood, people will, will not call upon the grace of marriage uh, to avoid divorce. The reason divorce is forbidden us is because we've been given the grace to live marriage in its original truth. Uh, and if we neglect that grace, then we shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised that, that our marriages are no better than they were before. And what we have now is, is, you know, sequential polygamy. So. Yeah. Well, sequential polygamy. Thank you, father. Ahmed. In uh, Exodus chapter 24, uh, whenever they go on the mountain and then um, it says that in verse nine it says that Moses then went up with Aaron and the other guys and they beheld God of Israel under his feet. Right. And uh, yet he did not lay a hand on a hand on these chosen children. They saw God and they ate and drank. And in Matthew 17, whenever they're on the mountain and then the uh, disciples, you know, they hear a voice of God, they get feared. Is that sort of uh, the same confused, confusing, confused idea of what God was uh, in the Old Testament? But here, and uh, Jesus touches these guys, touches the three disciples and um, they, they live. And you know, does that does that make sense? The the relationship between those two encounters with God on a mountain, yeah. Well, yeah, first of all, are I they think, like parallel? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, uh, and that's been, um, that's been pointed out for, for, for many, it's a great, it's a great uh, connection that you've made there. Um, first of all, the one from Exodus, we, we shouldn't understand it to be literal that they, that they saw God because I mean, that's a, a very important theme in the old Testament that nobody can see the face of God and live, but they, they see his, his glory, his manifestation. Um, but, but yeah, they, they, uh, they, they go up with, uh, the, in, especially in Matthew's gospel, our Lord is often depicted, um, presented as the new Moses. Um, he goes up the mountain, sits down, and then gives the Beatitudes, which are the Sermon on the Mount, which is sort of the new law, right? Um, and, uh, and then he goes up Mount Tabor and uh, with, with a few select. And, um, but, and, and again, it's, it's a theophany. It's a manifestation of God that, that in Exodus t- uh, 24, that they that they experience and then also in um on, on mount tabor in luke's gospel it says uh they were frightened when they entered the cloud so the cloud the glory of god the check out you know comes upon uh, uh our lord and the apostles on mount tabor and it says they were frightened and so yeah it's it's this holy fear uh that that uh that we saw first see on mount sinai now now uh, on Mount Tabor, and it also speaks to um, the new Israel, right? So what's happening? You you have, you know, it's, it's, gosh, this touches on so many things, right? Okay, so you have the new Israel um, in Peter, James, and John, right? They, they're going to be the new, the new, uh, uh, the new tribes of Israel, right? Uh, or at least three of them. It also speaks of, of, um, you know, the, the, the continuity and the discontinuity, so in order to emphasize that this is the same Lord of Israel, um, uh, a similar thing happens to them as happened in Exodus, right? But, also, but they also emphasize that it is different now. Uh, and so with our Lord, you see on Mount Tabor, there is a familiarity, right, with, um, with divine things. And it's, he's, he's, he's more than Moses now. He's not just a, a replacement for Moses. So yeah, that's a great connection. Father, um, this question is, 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 is excellent from Tim. He said, um, I, I noticed that the servant who owed a smaller amount acknowledges that he owes a debt uh, in regards to the parable of the ungrateful servant. How hard it is to forgive someone who hurts us and does not acknowledge the, that debt. And here's his question. How do we forgive someone who does not want our forgiveness? Big, big issue there. That, that is huge. Great question. First, show me in the Gospels where somebody asks our Lord for forgiveness. Doesn't happen. Uh, the good thief comes close. Remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Uh, Mary Magdalene washing our, our Lord's feet uh, in the house of the Pharisee. Uh, but that uh, that's ta- commonly uh, interpreted as an act of thanksgiving, not a petition. Uh, nobody in the Gospels goes up to our Lord and says, please forgive me or forgive me my sins. Nobody. Uh, when the paralytic is lowered before him, and, and Cardinal Ratzinger is writing on this uh, that I was delighted to encounter because it's what I, it's been in my mind for years. The, the paralytic is, is, is lowered before our Lord, this, you know, this huge operation to get him there. And he's lowered in front of our Lord. And our Lord looks at him and says, my son, your sins are forgiven, which is nice, but it's not what the paralytic was there for, right? (laughs) He probably thought, thank you, um, but I'm also a paralytic. I'd like to be able to walk. Um, So without his even asking, um, our Lord forgives him. So um, that is, uh, I think, something very important to keep in mind. Our Lord does not wait for people to ask forgiveness before he forgives them. Second thing is the distinction between forgiveness and um, reconciliation. We must choose to forgive those who have offended us. Uh, And um, I mean, think about your relationship with the Lord. It is because you know he's already chosen to forgive you that you are confident to go to confession. If you were doubtful about whether or not he's chosen to forgive you, you would never go to confession because you wouldn't know what to expect. You know, I don't know. You know, he might, he might not. Um, But the reason we go is because we know 
we know that he has chosen to forgive us. All we need to do is turn to him and receive that and be reconciled. So forgiveness is, is the refusal to, to hold anything against the person, the refusal to make the person pay for it. But we, we hear false forgiveness all the time, you know, like, oh, yeah, well, I'll forgive when he asks for it. Well, that, you know, that's not really forgiveness then. You're, you're sort of making them jump through a hoop. Um, forgiveness is precisely saying, no, I'm, I'm not actually going to demand it of them. Reconciliation happens when a person turns to receive the forgiveness that we are already extending to them, uh, that we have already uh, chosen uh, in our hearts to extend to them. Uh, and so, yes, we, we have to forgive those who, um, uh, who, who hurt us even before. And, it, and, and even if they never ask for our forgiveness, we have, that, have to have, I think St. Thomas says, calls it a readiness of heart to forgive, which means to, to you know, give it to them as, you know, immediately uh, when they turn to us. Um, so it, it's a very important principle. We, w- we will be forgiven, uh, of course, as we forgive, which is, a you know, you want to talk about harsh sayings in scripture, that's one of the scariest. Martin, go ahead and, uh, and unmute yourself there. Thank you, Father. And, and thank you, uh, Father Scalia, for uh, taking my question. So I have a, a good friend who's, uh, he's not a Catholic, but he's a very good Christian. I have a hard time sometimes explaining to him the, uh, the mercy that we need to have in, that, that the Lord teaches us about in the New, in the New Testament. Because when he's angry with righteous anger, at scandal, he tends to go back to the Old Testament uh, examples of, as you mentioned, the the man and the woman who were caught in adultery and were were uh, speared as a punishment. How how can I go about, you know, bringing him to to the New Testament? <laughs> well, I, um, Christ fulfills and transcends uh, uh, the the Old Testament, right? So if he can, I mean, your friend has to appreciate that the, the, the words of our Lord, they trump everything else, right? Exactly. <laughs> and so loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. And, and I mean, th- th- those, again, th- those, are, those are frightening words. Those are more frightening than anything in the Old Testament, honestly. Um, you know, this is an interesting thing. Um, because this really emphasizes the discontinuity, right? That our Lord has done something new. That he has given a new, given us a a new way of living. Phineas was was rewarded for his actions in the Old Testament, but our Lord has has done something new, and and we have to heed that. This also touches on a principle of interpretation. You know, the Quran um, uh, has has conflicting verses, right? And my understanding is that. It's just the one that came later that that that's you know that, that that's the one you go with the one that's and and um well uh our lord is the principle of interpretation and so the the goal is not to rid the world of all scandal because that will never happen the goal is to respond to things as christ would respond to them okay and um uh, which makes me, you, you said it was righteous anger. Uh, keep in mind, St. Thomas says that anger is the passion that most quickly departs from reason. Okay, probably because it's the passion that's most necessary because it's ordered towards self-preservation. But it, it means that, that it's very, very hard to keep anger on the leash. And if anger, we should be angry about the scandals. Absolutely. If you're not angry about the scandals, there's something wrong with you. You're either mindless or heartless. But we, that, has to be saying, that has to be in the likeness of Christ, okay? And, and he wept, and he knew scandal, and, and he knew it better than we did. So uh, other than pointing out to the, example, to the words and example of Christ, I mean, if your friend's not going to heed that, then, um, uh, then he has not fully yet come to, to Christ. Father Sklick, thank you so much. Would you thank please you. Uh, conclude us in, in prayer with your, with your blessing? Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God and Father, place deep within us a reverence for your almighty power, uh, and also a, an awareness of your mercy, which you make known to us uh, in your Son. 
May we revere him at his birth. May we also be moved to love him at his birth so that we will be with him throughout his life as we journey through the, the year with him so that we can, at every step of the way, come to love our, our Lord and Savior more. We pray this, invoke the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.